Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming one of the unsung heroes of exploitation movies from the 70s and 80s and the 90s, and I am talking about John F. Goff, the man who wrote such classics as Teenage Seductress, uh, CB Hustlers, Drive-In Massacre, um... The Hit List, or Hit List, I should say, and he starred in such classics as uh, Johnny Firecloud, The Buddy Holly Story, The Alpha Incident, The Fog, John Carpenter's The Fog, celebrating its 40th anniversary, and Alligator, and I can't wait, I'm having him on the show today. It's going to be so awesome talking about the exploitation movies of the past, and um, it's going to be pretty surreal and pretty awesome. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with John F. Goff. Hello? Hey, John. I was in the middle of another interview when you messaged me on Facebook. Oh, no problem. Yeah, is everything okay? I hope it was no problem for you. Oh, not at all. Not at all. I just got your message. I had my computer off yesterday. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> but uh, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? No, oh, I'm sitting here in Garcetti's ghetto and <laughs> staying inside. I know. It's a strange time and we're living 80 in. 80 years old, I guess that's the best thing I can do. Mm-hmm. Daughters are bringing supplies and going shopping for us. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's, that's so really good. How about good. you? Oh, just, you know, I, I live here at small town countryside in Reading, and uh, we're, okay. just, we're just staying inside, you know, not doing anything, and just hoping that someone's going to come up with a vaccination, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's rough. I haven't heard too many sirens around here. I don't imagine you hear that many out there either. No, we've only had one person die in this town since this started. Yeah. This is this is a mess. It is. It's <laughs> it's it, I thought 9/11 was scary, but this is scarier. Yeah. Yeah. You know. But uh this is such a wonderful honor, John. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure, Tommy. <laughs> I don't know what what you <laughs> can glean from an old hack, but here <laughs> I am. <laughs> So, going back in time, uh, did you gravitate towards um, acting uh, early on in your childhood? Uh, yes, I knew early on. I, I can't remember. I can remember when I was first fascinated with my My uncle ran the, uh, the Ritz Theater in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Mm-hmm. He was a the manager there, and he used to let me in before... Uh, before everybody else. When I was just a little kid, I'd go spend summers with him. And I'd go into that theater and then watch those uh, images form on screen. And I just, as far back as I can remember, all I wanted to do was act, Mm -hmm. be an actor. Yeah, I was reading you attended uh, Mississippi Southern University on an athletic scholarship. Uh, What sports did you play? Mm, no, I wasn't on an athletic scholarship. Uh, I don't. You, you're reading uh, IMDb. IMDb, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where they got that. I don't know where they got half this stuff. I attended a, a summer theater uh, at Mississippi when it was Mississippi Southern College. This is back in 1959. Mm-hmm. And uh, I did have a scholarship to that summer of summer theater. It was a summer theater. And I had been working uh, as an actor in in the local uh, community theater. And uh, the Mississippi Southern came down to the coast there that summer to open that summer theater and offered two scholarships to members of the theater. Uh, they were using the theater for that uh, that summer. 
mm-hmm. and I got one of them. Wow. Uh, but I, I played football and ran track in high school and dove competitively during the summers. And so I was an athletic dude, but I wasn't scholarship material. Okay. Yeah, I, IMDB, they get everything wrong sometimes. I don't, I don't know where they got that. Uh, they never called me and asked me, at any rate. Yeah. <laughs> some of it's true, some of it's not. The, the athletic scholarship, the athletic uh, career was nothing like what they make it out to be. Exactly. <laughs> You, you did a lot of um, summer stock. Uh, what Which plays did you do? Uh, and, well, I see, the first role I did uh, of any consequence was in the community theater there at the uh, Pass Point Little Theater in, in Pascagoula uh, was Bo Decker and Bus Stop. So that was my... That was my... Uh come out and I just loved it I just loved it and then I did a couple of other things and it was, uh, I did Helmer in Ibsen's A Doll's House and I <laughs> that was so much beyond me but I jumped in and gave it out gave it a whack and uh, then I got that scholarship I did that summer we did an original I was in, mm-hmm. and I did another Inge, did Hal Carter in, in uh, Picnic, mm-hmm. and Dracula in Dracula, and Reverend Toop and See How They Run, a farce. Wow, you did some good ones there. Yeah, and I met, uh, I met, um, girl by the name of Carolyn Lovelady who uh, later went on to tour with the, the Bishop's Company and she wrote me and recommended me and I left uh, to go on tour with them mm-hmm. uh, in the meantime I was working at the shipyard there in Pascagoula and Ingalls I had become a, uh, a pipe a certified pipe welder I was making top dollar for those days in the 1950s mm-hmm. and uh, in early 60s. And this uh, this paid, it was a repertory company called the, the Bishop's Company. And uh, toured churches, universities, schools, communities, doing you know, one night stands. And uh, uh, paid $10 a week in expenses. <laughs> <laughs> when I told my dad who was at the shipyard he'd been there all his life yeah and uh, so I'm you know I'm leaving he said what are you doing <laughs> 10 bucks a week in expenses I said well this is what I want to do so I took off and that was it I was gone $10 was a lot of money in those days <laughs> well, in those days, with all expenses paid, and we were doing six different shows at any given time. And if you weren't carrying uh, a lead in one, you were doing three to four other roles. We had six people to a unit. It was the best training anyone can get. I don't know where you get it anymore. Yeah. <clears throat> because when you were doing four different characters... And with just minimum of, pre- of props and no sets, uh, you were you you had to use your yourself, your voice, your body uh, to create a character mm-hmm. and distinguish it from the others. So I spent uh, a year and a half, almost two years, out on the road here with that. Wow. lining up in Santa Barbara. Wow. And this is another thing I, I read on IMDb. I hope it's uh, true. You uh, were writing reviews for movies. Yes. Mm-hmm. That is true. 
<laughs> yes, that I uh, I was down here. Well, I left. Uh, the company was headquartered in Santa Barbara, and when I left the road, I went to school back up there at City College. Mm-hmm. And an English professor by the name of Ray Lloyd, who later came down here to Hollywood, mm-hmm. and he was working for the uh, uh, the Hollywood Reporter as a regular, and we kept in touch through here. I was working at Chuck Barris Productions on Dating Game and Newlywed at the time. And uh, I had married and had to have something to... A friend of mine worked over there and fell in. I fell into that. But Ray uh, got an offer from the LA Times to go over there and he recommended me for his position at the Hollywood Reporter. So I went in and talked with the editor, James Powers, and they hired me. <laughs> I wound up as an assistant editor there. I was there for two and a half years, uh, writing film, TV, re- started out doing stage reviews, right, and wound up doing film reviews and assistant editing. Yeah. So yeah. that was the rich portion of time here. Yeah, do you remember any movies you liked or disliked? Yes. Uh, <laughs> one was the uh, uh, the Wild Bunch. I just, I loved it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was it was a groundbreaking thing at the time uh, because it did the Sam Peckinpah directed it, did the uh, the balletic murders with the squibs and blood, and uh, it was just, wow, when I first saw that, it just blew me away. Mm -hmm. But it's become a classic since then. I reviewed that, and... uh, It's a great movie, yeah. Did uh, did you you ever hear back from uh, anybody that uh, you gave good or bad reviews to? Oh, yeah, I ran into some <laughs> down the line. Uh, not many bad reviews. I heard um, from, uh, I didn't hear from him at the time, but we worked together later, uh, Stacy Keach. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, I had viewed another film, a film that he was in that never got much. It was called The Traveling Executioner. Oh, yeah. I know that movie. I think Jack Smite directed that. Yeah. Um, and it, it was, it uh, just fascinated me. And uh, he later told me that he had had uh, great hopes for that. Then it started, it tanked here in, the, in, this, in this country. And he was somewhere overseas or out on another location when they brought him that uh, that review, and he said, God, it just made me, it picked up my day. Because uh, he had been, I don't remember what film it was, but he said he wasn't really happy with it at the time. Yeah. Um, did that lead to you writing screenplays? Uh, no, not really. I had always written. Uh, but I didn't get into that until uh, they had a purge at the Hollywood Reporter, and uh, I realized I was, I'd been to, gotten divorced this time, and I was on my own, and I said, mm, uh, they can only qualify me as a writer. So if they want to send me out on something as a writer, that's fine. So I just sat for a year drawing unemployment and writing mm-hmm. and playing because <laughs> uh, I was in my uh, late 20s, early 30s then. And uh, I later, so I, I started screenwriting then mm-hmm. and uh, then was going to get married again. So I went to work at what I knew and. Uh, at the 
Daily Variety. I had had an offer when, uh, from Daily Variety and uh, took him up on, on that. And I was six months in, I was just, uh, I, I couldn't do it anymore. And uh, Bob Pearson, Robert E. Pearson, contacted me and said, uh, I want you to uh, go back to acting. I had met him in uh, Clue Gulliger's acting workshop in 1963. And we kept in touch through the years. And, and uh, he uh, he offered me the role of Leroy Bassett and Devil and Leroy Bassett. So <laughs> I said, okay, here we go again. <laughs> I... Uh, I didn't realize that Clue Gulliger was still teaching acting in 1963. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was his, I was in his very first uh, workshop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was he just as eccentric then as he is now? Yes, he was. <laughs> we did. We did a uh, uh, and a stage adaptation version of uh, uh, Tropic of Cancer that he had. Yeah. He had done himself, and it was uh, it was uh, it was a piece of work. Now, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> the other the other day, I interviewed James Drury, and I like I asked him about working with you know his co stars on the Virginian. And when Clue's name come up, I got a no comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Also had a had a summer theater, yeah, in Maggie Valley, North Carolina, in 1964, and he took me down there with that. And James Drury uh, came in as a, not a guest star, but just to make a personal appearance. Right. And I kind of got the idea that they didn't get along too well, but. If Clue was paying him to make personal appearance, he'd be there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For a guy who claims he, he was, yes, he was eccentric. He still is. You know, he's down in Hollywood. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, all the stories I've heard about him, yeah. And for a guy who claims he doesn't like acting, I mean, he sure uh, doesn't really show it with all these classes he teaches. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that he cares to do it any much anymore, but uh, it was fun working with him. It was fun working with him because he encouraged you to get totally out of yourself and into that character. It was it was fun. It was fun. Yeah, he actually had a cameo in the new Quentin Tarantino movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I laughed, yeah. I laughed yeah. out loud when I saw him because I had seen his name in the credits, but I didn't expect him to be playing a bookstore uh, clerk. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he did uh, He did one brilliant thing. Uh, I was with the Hollywood Reporter, and he called, and he had done a, a short film. But he said, I've, I've done a TV thing. Come on out here and take a look at it. And it was uh, an episode of The Psychiatrist, which was under that uh, the Bold Ones heading. They had four different shows, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one was The Psychiatrist. It starred Roy Thinnes and uh, a kid by the name of Steven Spielberg directed it. Wow. <laughs> Called, it was called Par for the Course. It was a story about a, uh, a golfer, which Clue did, mm -hmm. uh, faced with dying. And how do you treat somebody with this much life with, uh, with the prospect of, of knowing they're going to die? And it was, just, it, was, it was a wonderful piece of work all the way around, acting, performances, I remember the female, and that was Joan Darling, and she had one scene there that just would tear your heart out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I still remember that one. Oh, man, that's so cool, though. 
you got to see young Steven Spielberg at that age. Yeah, and I got to sit and talk with him for a little bit, and uh, he was, I don't know, 22, 23 at the time, somewhere around in there. Wow. Just before he broke out with Jaws. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to mention movies that you wrote. Tell me anything you remember. Okay. Teenage Seductress. Oh, God, I remember the title. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember a lot. I think that was uh, Chris Warfield, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't it? Uh, let me look it, it up. It was uh, written originally as Father's Night or Father's Day or something. Mm -hmm. uh, I just remember the title. I don't think I ever saw it. Buck and I wrote it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sandra Curry was in it, too. Mm, I heard it. <laughs> Some of these, it was just, well, gun for hire. Because I teamed up with uh, Buck Flower on uh, when we did Devil Leroy Bassett. Yeah, I was... And mm -hmm. We played brothers and had such a wonderful working relationship on screen and we just bonded and started uh, came back here and we began writing together and uh, sold our first one before uh, before we finished it to Pearson they never they never wrote it they never uh, filmed it went out trying to raise some money on it couldn't do it but uh, uh, then he had been working in low-budget films. I was working in low-budget films. And we knew what it took to put a low-budget film together. So we suddenly found ourselves uh, being contacted to write to a budget. Mm -hmm. And we both were actors both writers too, and both worked in, in crews. And uh, so we, we knew what it would take to get it done down and dirty and, and keep the storyline to it. Yeah, was he your best friend? A lot of creativity to it, but. <laughs> yeah, was he your best friend? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Over the years, we became absolutely best friends. Yeah, everybody remembers George Buck Flower for playing the homeless guy in Back to the Future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He got uh, he got a hold of that um, that that old scruffy character on a film called um, uh, The Wilderness Family: Adventures of the Wilderness Family. Yes, yeah, Susan DeBanti. She's uh, been on the podcast. A very sweet lady. Yes, she was. Yes, she was. I played the doctor in that, and Buck had that old character, and he literally says, shit, I'll play this character, I'll play this old character the rest of my life. And, <laughs> and he made a good career doing that, made a lot of money doing that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting here looking at a poster called In Search of a Golden Sky with him dancing on it. Uh, and we wrote that as... Uh, Children of the North Woods, mm -hmm. and then Jim Robinson and somebody, some other people got hold of it and um, rewrote a lot of it, re-shot a lot of it, and uh, it it became a disappointment. Uh, yeah, you were right though. Chris Warfield uh, did do a Teenage Seductress. Yeah. Okay. So that was. How about um, CB Hustlers? CB Hustlers, yes. I wrote that with uh, John Alderman, and Buck and I were doing Drive In Massacre at the same time. Both these were for Stu Siegel. Mm -hmm. And Buck was production managing Drive In Massacre, and. Uh, writing it with me. I'd write with him in the morning 
and then go over to the offices and write with Alderman on CB Hustlers at the same time. Mm-hmm. And uh, we filmed them right back to back, Drive-In Massacre and CB Hustlers. Uh, so it did a lot of cross sense blurring there. But that was that was fun. I enjoyed working for Stu Siegel. Yeah. And I enjoyed working for Chris Warfield. Chris Chris was such a great gentleman. Uh, he'd call us into the office and say, This is what I want. He'd give us a storyline and half the money. We'd go write first draft, bring it back. He'd look at it for a day or two, make his changes, call us back in. We go out, and make those changes, come back in, and he'd give us a check, and that was it. Never any hassle or anything. You get sometimes you get used to get hassles with some of these guys, but uh, not with Chris, uh, nor with Stu. But Stu also knew what he wanted. He was directing also, and producing and directing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my friend Janice Blythe, she was in the CB Hustlers. Was he? Yeah, she was. She? Oh, what, who was she? Janice Blythe. Janice. She, she was also in Drive-In Massacre, and uh, she she's best known for The Hills Have Eyes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, CB, CB Hustlers, this is, like, right at the beginning of, like, you know, Smoking and the Bandit and Convoy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That whole trend, <laughs> that, whole trend that started. <laughs> that was a good period. That was a good period for indies. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's, the whole thing has changed now. Hell, anybody can make a movie now. Yeah. Telephone. We were shooting 16 millimeter short ends half the time back in those days. <laughs> Drive-in massacre that was shot in what four or five days or something? Yeah, that's insane. <laughs> called, uh, me and Bakken said, "Look, I've got this. <laughs> I've got this drive-in. I can get it free. They're going to demolish it uh, in a, in a month or two. And he had, he was up against it for a time." period, and uh, said, I want to do something on a drive-in, totally, <laughs> so we did that. We, three of us, Stu, Stu worked on that with us. We never could figure out a good ending. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Uh, Roger Corman shot Little Shop of Horrors in two days, which is completely insane. <laughs> But then there were movies like this, and then later guys like Fred Olin Ray would shoot films in like four or five days. You know, I just that's like mm-hmm. that's like twenty hour day shoots. You know, and it's just yes, they were. Yeah, I, I can't believe that. You know, but I guess on a low budget, you you could get away with that. It's like it's like it's like doing for television. You know. Yeah. We had a lot of fun though. We really did. Yeah. A lot, lot of partying in between. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all that caught up with all of us, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as it always does, yeah. But I often wonder if they're having as much fun out there these days as we did then. I don't know. <laughs> I don't either, and I don't think they did. <laughs> how, about Joy, how about Joy Ride to Nowhere? Oh, I don't, we, we got a call to write that thing, and we were sort of getting sort of no really known around then, and we fought to get two weeks to write the thing. They wanted it faster than that, and uh, we went back to our hole, which was Buck's Den, and we sat there, and I was typing, and I looked up at Buck, and I remember I said, Buck, I can't work on this piece of, uh, for, for two weeks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he said, neither can I. Let's go get some beer. <laughs> so we got a case of beer and whipped, whapped it out in a week. 
and uh, Mel Wells took took it over. Said, okay, we'll take it from here, and uh, that's the last I've saw. I, I've never even seen the thing. Yeah, I did not. I didn't like it, <laughs> but I guess some people did. How about uh, butterfly? Now that was that was. I felt that was going to be one of the steps out of the independent field for me, out of the low budget, mm-hmm. anyway. Uh, when Matt, well, I had worked with Matt on a thing called uh, Seven Graves for Rogan. Yeah. Actually, I started out as a typist for him. I was just going to transcribe his work. I made a couple of suggestions, and he said, hey, you want to go to uh, Amsterdam? And, uh, yeah. So I wound up with the, with the credit on it. It was a Mario Puzo story originally. Mm-hmm. And we did get a good, really good script in that. And Rex Harrison, uh, Edward Albert, Ralph Malone, and uh, uh, a, a Korean producer, Charlie Lee, who decided he needed more action after we had filmed the story, and then chopped the story up, put more action into it, and released it as A Time to Die. It was originally called Mario Puzo's Seven Graves for Rogan. Mm-hmm. And it was, oh, it was a sweet, sweet really, really good piece. And uh, then we came back from there and uh, Matt put Butterfly together. And I, I, uh, I have good memories on that. And some bad ones too, but <laughs> mostly, <laughs> mostly good. And what, an inter- uh, what an interesting cast. You got Orson Welles, uh, St- oh, yeah. Stuart Whitman, who we just lost, uh, June Lockhart. I've interviewed her daughter, Anne. And yeah. Ed McMahon. That is very interesting. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Lois Nettleton. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lois was beautiful in this, uh, but uh, she got cut out. A lot of her stuff, her some of her good stuff was cut out. I always thought she'd be nominated uh, for the Academy when Award. we were filming it. Watching her, she was just, God, what a wonderful actress. Uh, and the ending was cut, so it's not, uh, it's not a, com- to me, it's not a complete film. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was disappointed. In fact, I threw such a bitch, I was asked to leave Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> they said uh, they wanted to cut the ending, and I said, no, if you cut the ending, because Pia Zadora wasn't in the last 10 minutes, and I said, if you cut the ending, you've got no film. Well, I got really, really drunk, <laughs> and... Uh, made a scene on the casino floor and well we were we were housed there at, at the Riviera Hotel which Michelle Rickless said who owned the hotel was putting up the money for the film mm-hmm. and anyway after that I was Matt called me the next morning and said how do you feel and in one of those mornings you know you say oh god I did something but I don't know what to, what what I did you wake up, mm-hmm. and the phone rang, and, and Matt said, uh, how do you feel? And, uh, I couldn't say I feel like crap, but I'm, well, I feel like, so how long will it take you to cut that, make that ending? And, mm, and I knew, just keep your mouth shut, cough. So I told him, it's about four hours. He said, all right, do it. And then call me. I'll come get the pages. And then you go home. I mean, back to Los Angeles and go out the back door. Talk, talk about the front. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's what I did. 
and they went on and filmed the rest of it. But I, I do have good memories about Butterfly. They, uh, they screened it last year down here at uh, Tarantino's Beverly Cinema. Right. And Matt and Pia and I went down and conducted a Q&A. That oh. was fun. Oh, that's cool, yeah. It's it, become sort of a classic now. Mm-hmm. It got, it's a good film. It's a very good film. Yeah. But uh, Pia and her husband, Michelle Merkley, got too much personal publicity. And then when Pia won that Golden Globe, uh, they, the press, made it into a, a pariah mm-hmm. uh, because they didn't want, they wanted someone else to win, obviously. But you really, when you think about it, at the time, the foreign press, who does the Golden Globes, the, foreign, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association was only like 35 people. So she could have won with five, ostensibly with five votes. Yeah. <laughs> and Reckless invited them to a screening, which is what all the studios do. Yeah. Invite people and critics and whatever. And hell, that's where I used to see them when I was with the Hollywood Reporter and Daily Variety. You go into a screening or you go to the premiere. Uh, and it's all done to influence. You know, so they. They did nothing more than what others were doing, and they got hung for it, uh, which hurt the film, mm-hmm. really hurt the film in the market. Yeah. How about uh, Hit List? Hit List, Bill Lustig. <laughs> that was fun. That was, uh, had, had some fun on that. Bill had liked my work. He was back in New York, and he came out here. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, to talk to me, and I so I went to work on him with him on that, and uh, Jan Michael Vincent, right? Um, it wasn't a bad film. It didn't have the budget really that it should have, uh, and the story really wasn't. Bill Lustig had the story, mm-hmm. uh, so I was a gun for hire. Uh, not that I could have done anything better with the story, but who knows? Who knows? But it was fun. Yeah, because you'd worked with him on uh, Maniac Cop. Just, uh, just a little bit, I think. I, I just did a role in that, yeah. Yeah. Didn't work uh, script-wise on him. Played Bill Campbell's lawyer, I think, on that. Now for the um, acting roles, um, you got to be in a movie with the legendary Ralph Meeker for the first time in Johnny Firecloud. Yes, that was uh, that was interesting too, and Ralph and I became uh, friends then. Uh, we worked in a couple of others after that. Uh, But Johnny Firecloud was, boy, that was a piece of work. Uh, We had fun on that, shot it up here in Piru. And uh, Ralph and I became friends, and I started to work with him on his autobiography uh, not long after that. And around Alpha Incident, we shot Alpha Incident up in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And... uh, both of us got so damn drunk we couldn't do anything. <laughs> so nothing, nothing ever really happened with that. But we had some fun getting together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome! Yeah, David Canary. Uh, before all my children, he had done yeah. uh, Bonanza. Yeah. Yeah. He was good in that. He was good in that. Yeah. Victor Mojica. I think Vic died last year. Oh. Uh, Meeker, 
the usual gang of suspects. <laughs> Us, myself, Richard Kennedy. Hmm. How about um, the timeless classic, the Buddy Holly story? Oh, that's so. Uh, that's a good film. Um, yeah. You know we're incarcerated here in Los Angeles now, and I'm 80 years old, so I. I I don't mind not getting out, but I sat up in TV watching, watching, sat up in the bed watching TV the other day, and that ran, the Buddy Holly story. Mm -hmm. And I had not seen it in a long, long time. So I sat and watched it, and I'm like, God, that's a good, it was a good movie. Mm -hmm. Don't make them like that anymore, but, you know, yeah, I guess if, if they made it now, you'd have to see... Buddy Holly climbing into the plane, the plane going down, and all that crap. But they yeah. stopped it on on a shot of him and told the rest of it. But it was a feel good movie. It felt good. It did. Yeah. It may not have been the truth <laughs> to, through a lot of that, but it, it was fun. And uh, I remember uh, filming that. So that was, I, I, I had uh, gotten that role. I had, it had been a dry spell. And uh, I remember they, it was notable because they did all their own playing and singing, you know. Mm -hmm. It was none of, no pre-recordings or anything like that. And we went into that studio and we ran through it, just rehearsal, and boy, he, after it was over, he put his guitar down, ran up into that control booth where I was, and I know, oh shit, yeah. I've done something now. Uh, <laughs> and he, I, I said, I need this job, what am I doing? And he, uh, uh, Busey, ran up and stuck his hand out and said, I'm Gary Busey. Who are you? And I told him, he said, that's wonderful. That was wonderful. Just like a producer. Because he had a music background. I didn't. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that, so that was fun. And oh boy, I get to keep my job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You must have been excited when you got that job. Yes. Because, um, my growth years were in the 50s, so I remembered very, Buddy Holly very vividly. Uh, his music was my music at mm -hmm. the time. So when I got that role, right, oh, great, great. Uh, and my uh, my oldest daughter, I think, was about uh, four years old then, and... Uh, her mother took her to the movie. It was playing out at uh, the Alfred Town at the time. Mm -hmm. And I stayed home. We just had twins. So I stayed uh, to watch them. She took uh, Wendy to the uh, to the theater. And when, <laughs> when Busey slugged me, it upset her so much they had to take, it, take her out of the theater. And... Uh, her mother had to bring her home here to show her that daddy was all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. How, how about the uh, Alpha incident? Oh, that's Bill Rebane. Mm. Uh, yeah, Bill Rebane, myself, Meeker. Oh, Stafford Morgan. I got all up Stafford. And Buck, we all went from here up to uh, Wisconsin do that. I have nothing but good memories about that. Uh, we had a great deal, great deal of fun. We sat in the bar playing poker after hours. And, uh, <laughs> Harry Utes owned the hotel and, and, and the bar there where we drank. And uh, Rebane, Bill still Walking along back in Wisconsin there. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I remember that one very well and very fondly. 
I still talk to Bill or Bain. Mm -hmm. Ralph's gone, Buck's gone, Stafford's gone. Jesus, I guess I'm the only one left. Yeah. Out of that. <laughs> ah. Yeah, I used to see that movie on the on the V on the um, video store shelf when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, it was uh, originally was entitled uh, "Gift from a Red Planet." Huh. And uh, I don't know. I, I guess they changed it for Marquee or whatever. The Alpha incidents. It was too long. Mm hmm. But. Uh, and Bill, I went back up and worked with Bill on uh, uh, Capture Bigfoot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the Alpha incident, I, I like that one. That was a good one. Yeah. Uh, again, low budget, night, uh, 16 millimeter. And then you worked with Chuck Vincent on Summer Camp. Oh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Chuck Benson and uh, Colleen Meeker. Colleen put that together mm -hmm. for him. Uh, I guess they were old buddies from back in New York, their New York days. And he came out here and... Uh, so he was doing porn out there. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck, uh, uh, I don't remember him a lot. I remember Colleen. Colleen said, come over and do this. So... I love Colleen, Colleen and Ralph. Mm -hmm. They were terrific. Then comes another timeless classic, John Carpenter's The Fog. Oh, yes, yes. I, I look forward to uh, Halloween every year. I you know, get, uh, get the residuals from The Fog and They Live, mm -hmm. which aren't much anymore, but <laughs> it's fun. I was going through the uh, through the garage out here the other day, and I found those glasses. Mm -hmm. They used uh, in the uh, displays on, on the theaters at the time of release. They had uh, glasses. If you turn them one way, it was the alien. If you turn them the other way, mm -hmm. it was the, it was me. And uh, I had a, a pair of those from one of the displays and my daughter was asking about that because they had recently seen the, uh, the fog mm -hmm. or, uh, on, on, uh, oh I'm talking about they live you asked about the fog yeah that's <laughs> okay oh the fog was uh, yes we filmed that and uh, uh, down at the uh, San Pedro down to the on the water there and hold one of those ships, one of those old boats, vision boats. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, then I went to, uh, they filmed myself and Buck stuff uh, in the hold and in the, uh, in the, Jesus, I can't think of the, the cabin. Uh, and and a bit on the back, the uh, when we were looking, mm -hmm. and then uh, I went to Europe. I went to Amsterdam to uh, work on uh, that uh, Uzo story with Matt. Mm -hmm. And I was gone for three months, and I came back, and John decided he had to see us die. So we went and filmed our death sequences out on a soundstage here in Van Nuys three months later. Mm -hmm. And if you watch closely, you can see that uh, my beard got shorter because I shaved it off over there, and Buck's got longer because he let his grow here mm -hmm. and there's not much of a change but I had to have a different shirt they couldn't find the shirt that I wore but they got something close to it and uh, in the death scene the death sequence yeah 
Wow. Oh, that was fun. That was fun. And then went into They Live later. Yeah, I like that movie, They Live. It's 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 hard to think though what genre it, it is. Is it it's, you think is it kind of horror, kind of sci-fi, kind of action, yeah. a little of all three, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I only worked one day on that one. That was uh, that was about it. That was it for me, but I enjoyed it. Did you see the the remake of The Fog? No, I haven't. It's ter- uh-uh. it's terrible. I'm not sure I want to see that. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, the carpenter the the carpenter version was just uh, it, he he has a uh, uh, just a way of putting something. I guess it's the carpenter touch. Call it that. Yeah. Uh, it just has more of a charm, more of a. I, I didn't. I didn't care for uh, his particular, uh, particularly his remake of uh, the thing. Right. Because it just lost that old charm, which is pretty much the same thing. Yeah. I like Kurt Russell though. Yeah, he's probably I'm buddies with his his father. Oh, Bing Russell. On stage yeah. with him, yeah, Bing. I worked on stage with Bing uh, in 1965 uh, and got to meet and know Kurt at that time. Kurt was 13, 14 years old then. Yeah. I did that. Uh, you did Alligator. How was that? I just, I had the one scene and it was just, uh, I went down, did that. Uh, I don't even know how I got that job, but I left that day going to uh, Las Vegas to do Butterfly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Went and filmed the scene and then took off. Yeah, Robert Forster. Yeah, I got to meet Robert Forster later. Um, I did a, uh, a one-man show of uh, Ernest Hemingway called The Le- Leopard. Oh. Yabo the Yablonski. And I did it on stage. And uh, the director was T.J. Castronovo, who was a big friend of, uh, of Forster's. And Forster came to the show a couple of times, as a matter of fact. Mm-hmm. And I got to meet him there. Nice, really a nice guy. Yeah, I think Burt Lancaster did the the leopard on film. <laughs> yeah, not the same one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this one was. This is called. Uh, it was called the leopard because it's an allusion to uh, uh, the leopard in Snows of Kilimanjaro. Oh yeah, the the Gregory Peck movie. Yeah. Uh, the Hemingway short story talks about the nobody knows uh, what a leopard was doing up here this high in, in the snow. He a frozen leopard up there. And uh, anyway, the, Yabo Yablonsk wrote uh, the movie Victory with Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. Uh, wrote this play. And it's uh, uh, the last, very last night of Ernest Hemingway. And he, it's runs concurrently with her talking about the, the leopard going up the mountain and his own climb to uh, whatever he gets, mm-hmm. culminating in, uh, in the suicide. And it's a wonderful piece of work, wonderful piece of work. I was in a, uh, a workshop at the Renegade Theater here with T.J. Castronova and Yabo Yablonski, and that's where they tapped me for that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I worked with in, in a 
another Jablonski play, Cracks in the Sidewalk, at the, that same theater. That was back, geez, I'm, uh, <laughs> 97, 98, somewhere around in there. Mm-hmm. You, play, you played a bartender in Under the Rainbow. Do you have any memories of that? Uh, just, yeah. Steve Rad called and said, uh, you know, you did a good job for us. And Buddy Holly's story would like to get you in here. And so I went out there, and I had lost like 50, 75 pounds at that time. Yeah. By then. And uh, I was just out there the one day as a bartender, and uh, uh, one memory I have of that is I spent all day long setting up a, a, an establishing shot on the day, a high shot. Spent uh, several hours. It was just seemed like a difficult thing. All I had to do was stand there. But uh, finally shot it, and Chevy Chase walked into the shot. He wasn't supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. Ruined the shot, and, and uh, so they had to go back and start it off again. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, uh, but I was just in and out on that one. Yeah. I, I noticed in these movies... Um, you had different names in the credits. Yeah. Uh, Jake Barnes, I use a lot. Because some of those, when I used a different name, because it was a non-union thing. Oh. And I could have gotten in trouble doing non-union work at the time. Yeah. So I chose uh, Jake Barnes which was symbolic to me anyway uh, the Hemingway character and in, uh, in, uh, Sun Also Rises it was Jake Barnes he had his had his nuts blown off in the war mm -hmm. he was, <laughs> couldn't do anything so I figured well that's you know that's apt so that's that's where that came from I see. Yeah, there's. I just tell them, just give me any any kind of name other than John Goff. Yeah. <laughs> what 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 does the F in your name stand for? Frederick. Frederick. Uh, I have an I have an uncle Fred. Yeah. So what are you doing these days? Nothing. <laughs> just sitting. I still meet with Matt Zimber, and we we've got a few scripts out there uh, but just let them float around I'm not pushing for anything uh, it's just the business has changed so much I mean it, it's just uh, uh, I don't enjoy it the way I used to yeah uh, I went into uh, went out on an in uh, in interview. God, it's been five, six months ago now. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was just it took an hour and a half, and it was the people were rude. Uh, it was not like used to be you go in and they'd say hey you know, gotta be a few minutes thanks for waiting this and they came out and said we're gonna we're we're gone we're we're gonna close down for a few minutes and this is a half hour i had to get up go and four other old guys yeah go put money into the meters and i saw the assistant out in the street laughing on her cell phone and uh, I wondered what the hell thing was about. And by the time I went in, I was so mad, mm -hmm. so angry, that I just blew it. I said, that, that's it. I'm done. And I came back and I told my aunt, I said, don't, don't send me out on any anymore. 
I'm done. So here I sit. <laughs> I back at an idea once in a while, uh, but that's about it. I enjoy my grandchildren and my children and my wife and just water in the backyard with tomatoes and flowers, roses, and that's about it. Oh, that's wonderful you got that at least. But yeah, the movie business, yes. <laughs> it's just there's so much bullshit going on. It's all corporate now, you know? It is. It is. And there's just no personality to it. I remember when you'd walk into an, uh, an agent's office. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm looking for representation. And let's sit down and, talk and say, tell me about yourself. Uh, but no more. You, 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 can't, you can't push the way you used to. And nobody wants to talk to you. They just say, send me a tape. Yeah. I get uh, people send, send new actors, actresses out here to you. You want to talk, friends? You want to talk to her? There's nothing to talk about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hmm. It's a completely different game now, but totally. You've you've left behind so much great work, though, John. And I thank you so much for coming on today. Well, my pleasure. My pleasure. I'm glad that you appreciate those old movies. I sure do, and. Yeah, God bless you that you got your grandchildren to to, to be, spend time with, you know. And I know most people they 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 go their whole lives wanting to retire, and then when they do, they're like, "Ah, oh, no, I want to go back to work." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, no, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, John. All right, Tommy. Well, thank you. How can I subscribe to your blog? <laughs> to my podcast uh yeah. let, let's connect on facebook and uh when this is up i'll, I'll tag you in it okay terrific yes you have yourself a great day sir and stay safe in this crazy time you too you too and thanks for thanks again for everything my pleasure sir all okay. right bye-bye bye-bye well there you have it john f goff ain't he a cool dude Wow, those great stories. He got to be a part of that crazy time in, in Hollywood when people were just throwing movies away. A time that needs to come back. It needs to come back. There's got to be somebody out there who's going to make it come back and say, fuck all the corporate structure. Um, <clears throat> if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.